Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, I present to you a quick review of the 2022 series Becoming Elizabeth, a production you will all be well acquainted with if you have been watching my unscripted videos. But now, I can give you at least a properly, albeit rather brief, scripted one. Back in late 2019, Stars Media announced that the next entry in their line of Tudor dramas would be a series about the young Elizabeth I before she was queen. Hot off the heels of Spanish Princess, I was a little… less forgiving back then, shall we say, and wrote it off as yet another one to add to the list of bad dramas. However, already there were signs that things would be a little different. For the first time, Stars would not be using the works of Philippa Gregory as a basis nor would Emma Frost be returning as a writer, the former declaring that she did not want any more adaptations of her works, and the latter moving on to set up her own production company. In their place, a relative newcomer was brought on, Anya Rees. Anya Pinatowski. Having been more used to writing for the stage and… EastEnders, it would certainly be an unusual choice, but at least we now had a chance of a bit of a change compared to the PGCU. Along with Rees, George Ormond would serve as a producer, a host of other writers would also be involved, and among the directors would include Justin Chadwick, who directed The Other Berlin Girl. Aye, aye! Things were looking up though, casting calls were put out, and it appeared as though the filming might start as early as mid-2020. But then, the thing happened that I don't need to elaborate on anymore, severely delaying production. The first bit of casting was officially announced in October, with German actress Alicia von Rittberg cast as the young Elizabeth, and then virtual silence for many more months. However, from about December of 2020, in the face of yet more stuff from the event, filming got underway and would last until June of 2021. At this point though, still silence on the casting, which was unusual compared to The Spanish Princess, which had announced everything in advance. This did not deter various people online, including myself, who snapped up every vague picture taken from production, every CV put out, and eventually people were able to piece together a lot of the cast. Soon enough, an in-production video was released in May, which I reviewed here by the way, giving us some more cast members, which would include Romola Garay as Mary I, Oliver Zetterstrom as Edward VI, Bella Ramsey as Lady Jane Grey, Jessica Rain as Catherine Parr, and Tom Cullen as Thomas Seymour, amongst a host of other names. After this though, virtual silence again for several months, and compared to Spanish Princess, which took six to seven months to release after filming had wrapped, Becoming Elizabeth took nearly a whole year, again possibly delayed by the… you know the drill. A trailer was put out in April, again reviewed here if you are interested, and finally, from June to August, the eight 55 minute episodes were released and it was… um… hmm… it's complicated. Let us have a look at why. The series runs from the death of King Henry VIII in January 1547 right up to, I think, 1553, but it is difficult to tell since the series plays some of the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. The main character, uh, technically... You guys all think you're so much better than me! Oh, that is the least fancy thing I have ever heard. Played by Alicia von Rittberg, is a bit of a mixed bag. On the one hand, she clearly has some talent, and can play some scenes very well. If I had to cite one example, in the first episode, she is talking privately to Thomas Seymour, and the subject of her father comes up. She laments how she never saw him, compared to everyone else, and doesn't even know that much about him. It was a very well done scene that honestly felt like it could have, sort of, maybe, possibly happened. Perhaps. On the other hand though, she just doesn't feel like Elizabeth. I know the historical queen wasn't always the heart and stomach of a king figure her whole life, but even in her youth, she was very careful and was quite cunning when it came to keeping out of plots and schemes. This Elizabeth, though, feels more like the stereotype that Tudor dramas give to Catherine Howard, rather than the careful planner who would give vague answers to put even the most cunning of interrogators off guard. Also, whilst I did state that she can act, most of her dialogue consists of her whispering slash weeping her lines which can get a bit tiresome if I were to be a bit cruel. Which, which I am. Still, if they were to do a season 2, she may start to improve if given a bit more to do in her own series. Now, all of this is well and good, 
but I do need to address the two main issues I have with this Elizabeth. Issue 1. In this early part of the series, she is a girl of 13 to 15. Need I say the then 27-year-old Alicia does not look anything like that age. Now, some will say, yes, but they had to age her up to do love scenes. First off, find an actor who was 18 then. In this very series, we have the then 17-year-old Bella Ramsey, who looks a lot younger. Find someone like that, and secondly, perhaps just don't have inaccurate love scenes with Elizabeth then? Which brings me on to issue two, her relationship with Thomas Seymour. Thomas Seymour, played by Tom Cullen, is a fine actor, and some scenes with him are honestly okay, sometimes. The one where he confronts his brother, the Duke of Somerset, after the latter has returned from Scotland and found out about Thomas's marriage to Catherine Parr, for example. However, aside from utterly cringe-inducing scenes where he sounds like a football hooligan, He is a bit too sympathetic, really. Although it can be argued he is shown to be very power-hungry and reckless. The main issue, though, is that, whilst it can at least be believable that Seymour would try and portray himself sympathetically to lure in Elizabeth, shall we say, her reaction to all of this beggars belief. The series in the first few episodes makes it out to be like it is a romance, and she is swept off her feet by him. In real life, whilst this whole ordeal is a bit sketchy, we do know that she expressed in letters that she did not want him near her, and seemed a bit put off by his actions to say the least. Here though, they went down a romance route that ruined it. Issue 1 really didn't help with this either, since, remember, Elizabeth was 13 to 14. Aging her up heavily downplays what was basically a 40-year-old man, effectively grooming a young teenager. By the way, from this moment on, I'll be referring to Thomas Seymour as Grumor, since I think it fits his character a lot better. Sadly, this isn't the only part that is off, and we do get a little bit of the old star's media curse in Jessica Rain's portrayal of Catherine Parr. On paper, this should have been perfect. Jessica Rain has a resemblance to the historical figure. She is about the right age, and she is a great actress. However, we didn't get much of the highly intelligent, learned, and warm motherly figure that was the historical Catherine. Instead of being treated to a sort of mishmash of Jane Boleyn from Wolf Hall and Cersei Lannister from Game of Thrones, Minus the balcony and desire for elephants. Gentlemen, I am not leaving without my elephant. Historically, we know that Catherine was one of the more motherly figures in Elizabeth's life, and even after sending her away from Chelsea, she still wrote to her in friendly terms and vice versa. And I think there is good evidence to support the idea that she sent Elizabeth away from Chelsea so she could protect her from Grumore. Here, though, she just sends her away out of jealousy and never even writes back. Not to worry, though. Despite living an extra year or so to see Elizabeth turn 15, Catherine still dies. Rather suddenly, in fact. So suddenly that it felt rather rushed, like the writers went, Ah oh well, time for you to die. We didn't get the historical death of Catherine where, whilst dying of complications from childbirth, she lambasted her husband for his actions. This husband, though, got off scot-free, and, unlike the real-life Grumore, who never saw Elizabeth again after Catherine sent her away, this one is out to continue his plan. Unfortunately, this leads to what I will henceforth refer to as a star's moment, i.e. an inaccurate and or over-sexualized scene that rather ruins a historical character. <laughs> this first star's moment occurs a mere days, possibly even hours after the death of Henry VIII, where Catherine Parr decides it is a good idea to go and sleep with Grumore. <laughs> I know they're trying to set up that she is ambitious, but, well, I don't think I need to go into details as to why that is bloody terrible. The second, and what I thought at the time was the worst star's moment, comes in episode two. Young Jane and Elizabeth are having lessons when Catherine and Thomas decide to have an argument right next door to them. That's bad enough. But then, they start making love, still within earshot of their young wards. But the crowning glory has to be in episode 5, where Grumore sleeps with Elizabeth, who, again, is about 15 during this scene. I would have thought they would have gone down the more subtle route, but nope, here we are. This whole plotline had a really nasty effect across the whole season, and brought it down quite considerably in my eyes. It could have been worse, I guess. 
Do you know what? There is one bit which I'm absolutely gutted didn't make it into the show. So Tom Seymour uh, was made Admiral. Um, and then in a bid to overthrow his brother, he uh, negotiated with a load of Irish pirates to try and stage a, a coup. I hear you're a racist now, Father. <laughs> Moving away from whatever the hell that was, the series did have some positives. I actually really enjoyed Oliver Zetterstrom as Edward VI, with him being the second best part of the series behind Mary. More on her in a moment. Edward, though, was portrayed, at first, as being quite nervous, having to fill the very large shoes his father had, and this was very noticeable in his first council scene. He is here, now technically commanding the greatest peers in the land, who'd been councillors for his father, and Oliver here did a great job showing a nervous boy falls into this position. As the series progressed, though, he got more and more confident and outspoken, particularly with his religious views, until, by the end, he's almost as fanatical as his late father. Hell, Northumberland comments on this back in episode one as well. And for a boy who hardly saw his father, is uncannily like him. I suppose they were both children in their own way. I can't elaborate on this much further in this quick review, other than we might have found the best actor to have ever played Edward VI. Granted, that is a rather small list, but an achievement nevertheless. Speaking of achievements, Romola Garay as Mary I is one of the standouts of the series. Dare I say, she might be the best actress to have ever played Mary. For the first time since Daphne Slater, we don't have a Mary at this point in her life who is an evil Protestant-burning, baby-eating monster, like we've gotten in many a production. Granted, towards the end of this series, she is beginning to slide towards becoming Bloody Mary. Hey, Becoming Mary would have been a better name for this series. But it is shown just how she gets to that point due to the numerous attacks on her faith that happen throughout the series, which is based on truth. Most of my favourite scenes in the series usually feature Mary, particularly the one she has with Edward. On top of that, the casting is almost perfect, with Romola Garay being in her late 30s at the time of filming, which closely matches Mary's age. The only criticism I would levy, though, is that, towards the end, she seems to be a bit too aggressive towards Elizabeth, thinking her younger sister is some sort of Machiavellian schemer, and sort of tries to... kill-timidate her in the woods. Of course, their relationship would definitely get strained once Mary became queen, and I'm sure deep down there was that burning resentment towards Anne Boleyn, but I hardly think Mary would be silly enough to think a young teenage Elizabeth was attending the Game of Thrones Academy on backstabbing. Nor would she go and write a letter to the Danish ambassador to inform them of a disturbing fact that they could not possibly know, that Anne Boleyn's daughter is the daughter of Anne Boleyn. Oh my god! Yeah, that whole marriage episode with the Prince of Denmark and Elizabeth, whilst loosely based on some plans that were thought about during Edward's reign, was a waste of an episode. Bella Ramsey as Lady Jane Grey should have been one of the best parts of this series, but she was criminally underused. Physically and characteristically, she was the absolute best casting choice they could have made. Her passion for the role is quite apparent when she went to this length for the audition. Lady Jane Grey, like her house, her like manor, whatever, was like close to where I, I live. And I actually shot my audition there. I know normally oh, like- did you? Yeah, you meant That's to do it. insane. But I was like, this is, I'm never going to get the chance to do this again. So I went to, uh, yeah, the ruins of um, Lady Jane Grey's residence and shot my tape there. I don't think I've ever come across an actor or actress going to the level of actually recording their audition tape at a historical location like that. Now, her first proper scene got some pushback with claims that she is way too confident, claiming that she wants to take the crown at this early stage. However, I don't think that is the way it was meant to be taken. Notice that, once Elizabeth starts pushing back, the mask slips, Jane's smile drops, and she starts to say she doesn't want to be there and wants to go home to her family. The stuff about the succession is her father talking, not Jane. Up until this point, all the scenes we have had of her are her father literally dragging her around, bragging about her place in the line of succession. So I take this as her trying to do what her father tells her, but then she begins to open up. But by then the damage is done, and it is too late. I will still agree, though, that Jane, even if she was parroting her father, she would have a little more tact. Although, again, if Elizabeth is canonically 13, 14 in this scene, then Jane must also be 10 or 11, meaning she hasn't quite evolved yet into the Jane we will see later, if that makes sense. Nevertheless, yes, that scene was definitely further down the list of good scenes in the series, shall we say. However, in the second scene with Elizabeth in episode 3, we do start to see some sympathy between the two. 
which is then promptly forgotten about in episode 7, as they basically replay the scene from episode 1, except this time Jane calls Elizabeth a whore at the end of it. Whore. And then she isn't even in the last episode, bar one line right at the end. What a wasted opportunity. A few general points before we move on. Timeline-wise, it is not too balked compared to previous offerings. Well, kind of. Catherine Parr and Thomas Grumore apparently live a little bit longer than they did in real life, the former dying just as Elizabeth turned 15, meaning this whole episode is fictitious, the latter being dead well before Cat's Rebellion, but at least it isn't characters living decades after their death. A few other events are moved around, like Jane arriving at Chelsea in late 1547, when she would have arrived there roughly at the same time as Elizabeth, but, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't mess things up too much. However, since the Grumore stuff takes up six episodes, we are then left with only two to cover the whole Northumberland's rule, including the downfall of Somerset, Edward's illness, and setting up for the Nine Days, amongst many other events that are left out. Well, I say setting up for the Nine Days, but we don't even really get to that since Edward has recovered. Until he doesn't. We had a whole episode that could have had that stuff, but alas, no. Better pray for a season two then. Overall though, a mixed bag. And I haven't even scratched the surface with this quick review. Hell, I didn't even talk about the Duke of Somerset, the Duke of Northumberland, the Duke of Suffolk, Robert Dudley, Amy Robsart, Pedro, and a fair few others, since there's just so much going on. You'll have to wait for Tudor Rat 7 for that, I'm afraid. This series, though, is basically the Marmite of Tudor dramas. Some of this you will love, the rest you will hate, and nothing in between. I must say, compared to the more modern Tudor dramas of late, this one did at least make an attempt to look authentic. I have covered costumes in the videos I made previously, but it does bear repeating. This series was a massive improvement over Spanish Princess, and the others when it came to outfits. The dresses the ladies are wearing are, usually, pretty accurate, and many are taken from contemporary portraits of the era. French hoods are also worn, which was a relief, since I'm sick of sodding headbands and everything. One nice touch was the nightdress Elizabeth wears in this scene is actually based on a surviving example from the 17th century. However, sadly, we do still get some scenes where the ladies have their hair loose, which, even around home, would not usually be a thing, although at least it is confined to the more private scenes, well, most of the time. Gentlemen's outfits are a bit better also, compared to the PGCU, but some of the sleeves should be a bit puffier, and, like some of the ladies, they lack hats. Fine for scenes set inside, say, the Privy Council, where they may well remove them out of respect for the king, but outside, particularly when you're riding around, no you want a hat on. Sadly though, the military has not improved at all, and the Battle of Pinky feels like the usual slap fight in the fog we've come to expect. Hell, could we not at least hear some cannons and muskets please? The English had support from the Royal Navy during the battle, you know. Sets though, are really good for the most part. A lot of the series was filmed on location in some great Tudor looking buildings, most notably Haddon Hall, which seems to be the go-to Tudor filming location of late, so we get to see some lovely wood panelling, tapestries and fixtures galore. However, there are a few moments where you can tell they have crudely spliced together different locations into one, like this scene of Edward walking up what I think is the stairs of Bristol Cathedral, and then it cuts to Haddon Hall, both locations standing in for Whitehall, even though they don't really blend together at all, but other than that, pretty good. There is one ironic mistake though, with this fireplace having the more modern coat of arms of the United Kingdom, as opposed to the arms of Tudor England. The irony coming from the fact that it is in Edward's private quarters, when they are talking about the plan to unite both crowns, but I'll be forgiving and assume this was a location and the fireplace was like that, as opposed to a set, since the arms are correct on the canopy of state in other scenes. Language though, is a huge problem. If you watch this series, do not try and count how many times a character says, fudge. You will die trying. It is really jarring and rather tiring, due to just how many times they say it. It doesn't add anything other than to make it feel like it isn't one of the other dramas. I'm not saying it should have been constant yees and yays throughout, but please, broaden your vocabulary. However, there were some pretty well-written scenes here and there that didn't suffer from this problem, so I am glad we got that at least. In terms of authenticity then, Broadly, a lot better than before, but sadly, we do still get a few letdowns. In terms of its value as a drama, I would say it is definitely better than Spanish Princess. Admittedly, that is not much of a bar to climb, but it's something. Nevertheless, we do have some wonky parts. We don't get too many weird logistical moments in the vein of the PGCU, 
Although Elizabeth does go and ride off alone from Chelsea to Whitehall to see Edward, which was a bit weird, but then there also are some parts that are very rushed. As I mentioned, the Battle of Pinky is about 30 seconds of the usual whack-a-mole in the fog, with some characters look like they are from Skyrim. What in oblivion is that? My guess would be that the budget did not extend to the military side of things, but it is not the only part that feels rushed. The Dudley brothers were kind of just introduced and not really properly set up, aside from a casual mention that Robert was a friend of Elizabeth. A lot of important characters were left out. Hell, if I had a penny for every time Henry Gray mentions his rather important wife Frances Brandon, but we don't see her, then I would have five pennies. It's not much, but still, five pennies too many. I am aware that they had a lot to cover, but perhaps this could have been solved by, you know, not ruining Catherine Parr with unnecessary sleeping scenes, or wasting six episodes on Grumor. But we have already gone into that. Speaking of necessary sleeping scenes, shall we say, this series does have its fair share. Most notably, the Elizabeth Grumore one. But my doctor has just informed me that my blood pressure is too high, so I will be brief. Why were there so many of these scenes and such a focus on the Grumore stuff? That could have been covered in four episodes, giving us the second half of the series to look more at Northumberland, May's religious conflict with Edward, setting up Jane, and so on. In fact, the whole last episode of the series was a waste of time. Bar Somerset's death, we basically reset back to square one, and didn't even get to the nine days, which would have been the dramatic end for the season. A part of this production that must be criticised is the really wonky camera work. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, this series was directed in part by Justin Chadwick, who gave us the sickeningly yellow filter in The Other Berlin Girl, which to this day still burns my eyeballs. My eyes! And it appears he may have had some influence yet again. I didn't mind the more darker tone with natural lighting. This was a pretty grim period after all. My main concern though was the constant shaking and weird swaying all the time, which made me think I was on a boat. Not that I have much experience with that, my only nautical adventures being a trip on the King Harry ferry when I was six, and nearly being dashed off the rocks at St Michael's Mount when I was ten, but anyway I'm getting carried away. The camera shaking made it really hard to concentrate, and a few times I was wondering if I should warn the court that an earthquake was going on. They did put a lot of work into the special effects though, and I must say Grumor's execution was quite gory and realistic looking. One part that will not be getting any praise from me though is the soundtrack. Dare I say, this is probably the worst thing I've ever heard in the period drama. I will still complain about the music choices in the previous series, but by golly, they sound like Beethoven by comparison. All the music in Becoming Elizabeth is very techno and funky and modern, and it ends up sounding like a cheese grater murdering the Beatles. Well done lad. The Beatles are all dead. Barely any of it fits the mood very well. Literally anything else would fit. This was all very deliberate, I am afraid. The composer, Tim Phillips, said this in an interview. Anya's scripts very deliberately referenced a wide palette of musical cues, which I thought indicated a desire to shake us out of any period drama comfort zone, but also had the effect of plugging the story directly into modern day sensibilities, said Phillips. Thus, I went about unearthing an instrumentation, including an array of found sounds from my home in the country. Ah! I'm the trash man! As well as modern synths and instruments, string orchestra, choir, etc., that help support this. Parts of the score incorporate microtuning and mimic animal sounds that the Tudors would have recognized. Ah! 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 The theme tune is the central pillar of the score, which riffs on it in lots of variations. But different characters also have their own languages. And now we come to the sentence that really peed me off. We deliberately ignored any period instrumentation or compositional techniques, and I think this gives the piece an energy and an immediacy that feels very contemporary. Yeah, so it is null point for me on that one. I'm not saying you have to slavishly copy the music of the era, but when doing a period piece set in the Tudor era, at a time when even kings were keen composers and created songs that are still played today, you really should try and incorporate that into your work. Need I, yet again, bring up films like A Man For All Seasons, which greatly benefited from using Tudor-style music? If we had some sort of rap going on while Sir Thomas More is making his final statement before sentencing, then that would have greatly lessened the impact of that work. Overall, 
it's a bit of a mixed bag, really. On the one hand, we have the same crappy love scenes, bad music, ruined characters, horrible pacing, and some odd choices when it comes to the story, Elizabeth and Groomore's relationship being the most prominent. On the other hand, we get the best portrayal of Edward VI, the best Mary I, and a slightly squandered best Lady Jane Grey, with much better costumes than previous offerings, and stories that are at least a lot closer to the truth than the PGCU. It reminds me a bit of Cromwell, with how you can have, say, Charles I be very accurately portrayed one minute, and then the next scene is some weird alt history where Cromwell beats an army more than twice his size at Naseby through the power of plot armour. I think Stars has made some steps in the right direction with costumes, casting and so forth, but sadly, we still have some of the same old tropes seeping in, meaning we might have to endure more of this for years to come. At the time of recording, it has not been announced if there will be a second season, but given the viewing figures, I do half wonder if we won't get one, which would actually be a shame, since I would like to see Lady Jane Grey and Mary's stories be told in full. Although, knowing stars, they would have Elizabeth be Jane's executioner, bring Grimoire back from the dead, and end it all with Mary being murdered by the ghost of Catherine Parr. In the meantime, this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.